In just over a minute's time, we head once more along the history trail back to the 17th century. It's 1642, and Britain is preparing for war, civil war, a rebellion against the king and his supporters. Britain armies gathered to fight each other and that meant people had to decide which side they were on. London was the headquarters of the parliamentarians who were nicknamed roundheads. The king had to leave London because he had little support there. He set up his headquarters at Oxford with his royalist army, the Cavaliers. Most people who lived near London supported the parliamentarian side. They joined armies in East Anglia and in the southeast of England. Many of the parliamentarians were Puritans. The king's supporters came from further away, from the northwest of England and from the west, where there were still many great noblemen, from Wales and from Cornwall. There had been no battles on English soil for over a hundred years and many people were afraid of what might happen. They were afraid that law and order would collapse, that fighting would make things worse. They thought that the country's rulers were like the stones of an arch. Each one was necessary for the arch to stand up. So, there's the king at the top of the arch, supported by the noblemen and the bishops and the clergy who all work together to govern the country. And underneath all of those, the ordinary people, like you and me. Now, what would happen to this arch if you took away any one of these stones? Let's say the bishops. The Roundheads hated bishops, but the Royalists were afraid that the country might collapse without them. And the Roundheads weren't only threatening the bishops, they were also threatening the power of the king. This is how the Roundheads saw the king, far too big. What would happen to our model arch if one of the stones was too big? The arch would collapse under its weight. So the Roundheads wanted to make the king less powerful. This is Nebworth House in Hertfordshire. I've come here today to watch a group called the Sealed Knot fight a battle in exactly the way that battles were fought during the Civil War. Nobody will get killed today, of course, because this is a hobby. Some of them have even made a Civil War soldiers' camp. 
These bits we sew together. Yeah. And these large bits of willow gathered by my man. Yeah. To help support the frame. And we sleep in there as snug as the Lord and the King allows. <coughs> Sir? Ah. Uh. Would you explain these arms to this young lady? Well, these here are halberds, which are the badges of rank of a sergeant. Yes. Uh, a pole axe to you. Right. Let's lay you. these down. And then the, the muskets here, the long arms that we use are matchlock muskets. They fire three shots in two minutes. Now, I'm very interested about these. They look wonderful. What are they? Well, these are the 12 apostles. They're wooden charge holders for the matchlock musket. Each one holds a separate charge of gunpowder. And uh, you see the top fits on there as they hang, and then you can easily pull the top off with thumb and forefinger and pour the powder down the barrel. Oh. As well as that, you've got a bullet bag here yeah. that contains ounce and a quarter lead bullets to make a hole in a man as big as a dinner plate, should they come upon any proximity to us. Now, the soldiers in this war, this cruel civil war, are fed very sparsely. We have a pound of bread and half a pound of cheese per man per day. To give themselves courage, they would sing rousing songs. Soldiers with swords in hands to the walls coming, horsemen about the streets riding and running, sentinels on the walls arm armor crying, petards against the ports while fire applying, when cannons are roaring and bullets are flying, he that would on a win must not fear dying. When cannons are roaring and bullets are flying, he that would on a win must not fear dying. Trumpets on turrets high, they are a-sounding. Drums beating out a loud echoes resounding. Alarm bells in each place, they are a-ringing. Women with stones in laps to the walls bringing. When cannons are roaring and bullets are flying, he that would on a wing must not be dying. And when cannons are roaring and bullets are flying, grabbing away. On the battlefield, a preacher might inspire them with a psalm. Let the wicked perish before God, but let the righteous be joyful. Each regiment had its own flag, but because soldiers all wore the same sort of clothing and not proper uniforms, it was not easy to tell which side someone was on. These are cavaliers, and these roundheads. Cavaliers won this battle, the survivors gather around their flag and prepare to march away. And the women tend the wounded with herbs and carry off the dead. But what did the ordinary people of England think about all this fighting? 
At the beginning of the war, nobody really wanted to know. For one thing, the war began in August, harvest time. It had been a wet summer and the crops weren't good. And it was far more important to gather them in than to take time off to fight a war. At one battlefield, a soldier had to ask a farmer to stop ploughing his field so they could have a battle on it. This cartoon, which was drawn during the Civil War, suggests that the war was like a Punch and Judy show and that the soldiers were like puppets worked by politicians. The people of England are just standing and watching them, like an audience, while the farmer takes no notice and tries to get on with ploughing a field. Most people didn't want an army in their town. The soldiers would move into their houses, sit at their table, eat their food, drink their ale, and possibly even steal their possessions. In the West Country, groups of villagers called clubmen ganged up against both the Cavaliers and the Roundheads. They knew that both armies could be cruel and violent, stealing their cattle and threatening their wives and children. But some towns suffered even worse fates than that. This is Newark in Nottinghamshire. Newark was one of many towns used as headquarters by one of the armies. Here, it was the Royalist Army who set up a garrison in the town centre. For four years, the Royalists held Newark. Three times, the parliamentarians surrounded the town and tried to starve them out. Newark became a town under siege. This is what Newark looks like today from the air, and if we look closely, we can see why Newark was so important to both armies. Here's one reason, a road running from London in the south to York in the north. It's called the Great North Road. And here's another, a road running from east to west. The Roundheads link to East Anglia. It's called Foss Way, and both these roads cross in the centre of Newark. And flowing right through the middle of the town, a broad river, which was very difficult for the armies to cross. The River Trent. So there were two vital bridges where the roads crossed the river at Newark. The army that could control Newark also controlled these roads and bridges. You can still see many of the Cavaliers and Roundheads' defences today. In fact, I'm standing on one of them, the Queen's Scots. It has steep banks of earth, and would have had wooden spikes at the top to stop the enemy climbing up. And here's why it was built, to defend the bridge where Foss Way crosses the river. Again, we can see things more clearly from the air. The Queen's sconce is at the bottom of the picture, a fort shaped rather like a star. This map of Newark, drawn during the Civil War, helps us to see why the fortifications were star-shaped. There's the Queen's sconce at the top. The points of the star jutting out allow cannon to fire in all directions at the enemy. From November 1645 to May 1646, Newark was completely cut off. The whole town was surrounded. There were 9,000 parliamentarian soldiers outside the city walls, with 7,000 reinforcements from Scotland. But the royalist governor of Newark, Lord Bellasize, was a good soldier and his troops were brave men. And the people of Newark had their own food supply. They kept cattle and sheep on this piece of land between the two branches of the river. It's called the island. When the island at last fell to the enemy, the plight of the people of Newark became desperate. They were now right up against the old city walls and castle. Siege engines or mortars like this one called Roaring Meg bombarded the town. You can still see the marks made by the cannonballs on the walls of the church and castle. Ladders against the walls, they are up rearing. Women great timber logs to the walls bearing. When cannons are roaring and bullets are flying, he that would on a wind must not fear dying. When cannons are roaring and bullets are flying, he that would on a wind must not fear dying. But as the noose tightened, many villagers from outside Newark fled into the town. There was no shelter for them, so they had to huddle under the castle walls, and there was no proper food. Why, mistress, we're reduced to eating dog. Even the horses have been eaten. 
we have to eat dog. A few nettles, some comfrey. Out yonder lies the Earl of Leven, camped on our pasture lands, where our cattle should be now breeding. Even the few cattle that we did bring into the town have been eaten by the garrison, and not one shilling have they paid us for the meat. Not one barrel of salt beef have we left. When we return home, I know not what we will find. I kept a fine alehouse up at Upton till the damned Scots came. They call themselves men of God. We had to flee for our lives straight to the town. They told us we'd be safe here, but I know not what. There's no safety anywhere, I think, for the likes of us in these days. They even had to make their own coins, siege tokens. Tokens, they're no good whatsoever. We've got no food to buy, nothing. And in this rotten, stinking, infested town, there's nothing left anyway. They had it in the town before we even came here. Everything's gone. And the sickness from the children and the plague that's coming now. The governor's burning the houses that's had the plague. And the children, they're just dying all the while. We'll not yield to Cromwell's scum. And his Scottish heathens. Our King Charles will rescue us from him. He'll bring his army. He'll send them packing where they came from. And we must stay here to welcome him. But King Charles did not rescue them, and the army did not arrive. And as the siege continued, the plague grew worse. More people in Newark died of the plague than died from the war. Lucy Hutchinson, who wrote a diary at the time, put the deaths at over a thousand, a quarter of the town's population. After the siege, people were so frightened of the plague that they stayed away from Newark. That's why there are so many fortifications still standing. No one wanted to come and use the land. In the end, Newark was not taken by force. The war had been going badly for the Royalists, and on the 27th of April, 1646, King Charles left his headquarters at Oxford for Newark, disguised as a priest, hoping against hope to make a pact with the Scots. But it was not to be. By the time he arrived, he was no longer a free man. He spent his last night of freedom here, at this inn at Southall, eight miles west of Newark. In the morning, he was taken prisoner by the Scots, and he ordered Newark to surrender. It was the end of the siege, and just about the end of the Civil War. The Royalists had been defeated, the Parliamentarians had won. After the war, Oliver Cromwell, the Roundhead leader, became the most powerful man in England. At first, he wanted to make an agreement with the King, but some of the Roundhead soldiers, called the Levellers, wanted a new kind of government, without king or bishops. They said that the country should be governed by the people who live in it, not by noblemen. And it was here, at this church in Putney, that the Levellers argued their case to the Roundhead generals. We did not fight for money, they said, but for our beliefs. But the generals would not listen to them. The levellers' demands were ignored. The king, meanwhile, had been secretly raising another army, and fighting broke out again. A second civil war, more bitter and more violent than the first. And it ended with an event that many had feared, but few had wanted. King Charles I was tried for treason against his own subjects, found guilty, and on the 30th of January, 1649, he was brought to the Palace of Whitehall and executed. In spite of the freezing January weather, a huge crowd had gathered to watch the execution. The Civil War had started with a desire to limit the King's power. Now it had ended with his death on the scaffold. Few people rejoiced at his death. It was said by one who saw his execution that a terrible groan went up from the crowd. Such a groan as I never heard before, and desire I may never hear again. So Be
the sound.